Uh, so good evening to all of my WFP family and thank you for joining us on tonight's WFP assembly. My name is Maurice Mitchell and I, I want to start by asking us all to reflect on what we've seen uh, and what we've experienced through this past year. What that trauma has felt like. Now, half a million people died of COVID. And that's just the official counts. And it doesn't have to be Black History Month for me to remind you that deaths were concentrated in Black and Indigenous communities and among essential workers. So every Black person I know knows somebody who has died. And almost everybody I know, every working person I know, knows somebody who has died. Millions have suffered due to this illness. And for some, this illness is still life altering. Now, there's been tens of millions of people who've lost their jobs. Relief checks and unemployment have kept some just above water. Others are drowning. Hunger, including child hunger, rose dramatically this year. And tomorrow, the rent is still due. And the worst of it all, none of this had to be this bad. Now, it's hard to feel outrage and grief for a full year. The fact that we went through this is, is still a lot for us to sit with and it's still a lot for us to even process. Now, last year we sent Trump packing, which is wonderful and we should always honor that work. But still millions of Americans are, are still living in an emergency. And, and while Congress gets bogged down in parliamentary maneuvering, I, 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 want, I want us to, 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 to just be reminded of the urgency to fight for the world we deserve. Now, our roadmap the WFP's roadmap out of crisis is called the People's Charter. Joe Biden and the Democrats in Congress have an opportunity and a mandate to go big, to travel that roadmap. Now, to act like it's still an emergency because it still is an emergency, but it's also on us. We must throw everything we can into making sure that they do. So Friday, just this Friday, the House passed Biden's relief package. Not one Republican voted for it. Now, it's a credit to progressives like Representative Cory Bush, who you'll hear from tonight, that beat back efforts to make the package smaller, including efforts to strip out a $15 minimum wage and to restrict relief checks. Now it heads to the Senate where an obscure and unelected parliamentarian has just ruled that the $15 minimum wage can't be included in the bill. I will remind you, tax cuts for billionaires needed only 50 votes, but a living wage needs 60. This to me and many of us on the call is outrageous. Now here's my question. Why does it seem that the people that always have to compromise are working class folks or poor folks or people of color? Why is it that progressives are always the ones who have to give up ground? Are we slowly sliding back into Congress and business as usual when the circumstances are anything but normal? Now, polling found that 39% of voters think the Democrats' current relief package is just about right. Only 20% think it's too big, but 40 think it's too small. By shrinking their ambitions, Democrats are making their own plans less popular and less effective. Republicans voted against the package because they hope the economy is still struggling when the midterms come along. They are betting on your suffering. See. If Democrats fail to go big enough, it feeds the cynicism that the government can't accomplish anything that will truly make a difference in people's lives. And that in turn reduces people's motivation to go out and vote. And that helps Republicans. The people gave Democrats control of the presidency and Congress. Our expectation is results. Now I'm gonna quote Star Wars. As Yoda said, do or do not, there is no try. But we can't sit back to see if they learn that lesson from Master Yoda. It has always been true that transformational change requires a bottom up movement of people demanding it. I want to tell you about your role in the next big fight for jobs and recovery. We're supporting a plan called Thrive, launched by the Green New Deal Network, a coalition of leading people's organizations, including environmental justice and climate groups, as well as unions. Thrive is a down payment on the Green New Deal. It calls for creating and sustaining 16 million new jobs. 
in transforming our energy sector to clean energy, modernizing and retrofitting homes and buildings, cleaning up the environmental damage that has plagued Black, Brown, and Indigenous communities, and investing in care jobs like childcare and elder care. It's a plan that sees the struggle for racial justice, climate resilience, and economic recovery as all connected. It's how we build the world we deserve. At the end of March, Congress has a two week recess period where members will go back to listen to their districts. We're calling this one recovery recess and I'm asking you to be ready to step up. I'm asking you to make sure everyone you know turns out to a recess town hall meeting no matter where you live. Now, the New Deal only happened because labor activists and others demanded immediate action to end the depression with a, so a new social contract. The Civil Rights Act only passed, not because of the righteousness of elected officials, but because of sit-ins and boycotts and marches from the civil rights movement. And, and that grassroots movement made it so, and made something that many thought would be impossible, very much possible. Friends, this is a moment of crisis. It's also a moment to make history, to match the crises we've lived through with a government that could actually deliver jobs and care. During the upcoming recess, we need to be ready to take on the mantle of leadership and show up in big numbers at virtual town hall events all over the country and tell every single member of Congress about the dream we have of a brighter future. There's an old story about FDR meeting A. Philip Randolph, the black labor leader. After Randolph made his case, FDR said these words, I agree with you. Now make me do it. Friends, the people are the keepers of our democracy. If we want to see a different world, we must be ready to pick up the mantle and make them do it. Thank you. Now I'm gonna ask you all to hold your applause for our next amazing guest who's also a great friend of mine. Her, her byline is as impressive as she is. And, and I want to make sure we give her all of her flowers tonight. Our next guest spent nearly two decades helping build the Think and Do Tank Demos, where she served four years as president, moving the political needle on debt-free college, a living wage, and democracy reform in the process. Her leading expertise on economic justice and cross-racial solidarity has made her an influential voice in the media and an NBC contrib contributor and a sought after public speaker. She spent her career drafting legislation, and develop strategies for organizations and campaigns that one changes to improve the lives of millions. And tonight, I am honored to introduce her as, of, uh, as she releases her book, The Sum of Us, What Racism Costs Everyone and How We Can Prosper Together. By the way, it's a New York Times bestseller. Now, this book comes at a powerfully pivotal moment in the fight for Black liberation. And, and it really offers our own roadmap out of crisis, along with a brilliant analysis of how we arrived here, divided and self-destructive, materially rich, but spiritually starved and vastly unequal. And last but not least, our, our next guest is also a friend of the party, a member of the party and a member of the WFP's executive committee, where she helps guide our vision and strategy towards a future for the many, not the few. So let's give a warm welcome and a huge congratulations to our next guest, Heather McGee. Hey, hey, hello everybody. Oh, how I wish we were in the same place, making so much trouble. Um, thank you so much, Maurice. I'm so honored to be with you all tonight. Um, I can't wait to hear from Representative Cori Bush, um, who I know is having technical difficulties. Um, just overwhelmed at the way that the book, The Sum of Us is, is being picked up and people are responding to it. I can't believe a book about cross-racial solidarity that has 50 pages of, um, <laughs> of a love letter to collective organizing and collective bargaining is, is on the New York Times bestseller list. I mean, something is afoot in this country. And I just, I feel very humbled and excited to share and have a conversation with Mo about it with you tonight. Well, I am super excited to get into this conversation, Heather. Um, and congratulations on all of your success. So to the people who are meeting you for the first time, I just want to underscore that you are an economic and political expert with a huge breadth of knowledge. And 
for your new book, you did this extraordinary cross-country trip where you collected stories and marshaled economic and sociological research to paint an irrefutable story of racism's cost. And I, I know this is a big question, but I wanna start by asking, what surprised you during this journey? You already came from a place of profound expertise. What did you see or hear or learn that you weren't expecting? That's such a good question, Mo. I, um, so as you said, you know, I spent 20 years uh, helping to build and then leading a think tank that all, often worked arm in arm with the party to address inequality. and you know, I was guided by this vexing question of why is it that Americans can't seem to have nice things? And by nice things, I don't mean like, you know, self-driving cars, which we don't need, thank you very much, or laundry that does itself, which I think we actually could use, be great right now. Um, but I mean things like universal healthcare and childcare and reliable world-class modern infrastructure and a well-funded school in every neighborhood. And so, you know, after years of trying to bring the economic facts to policymakers and make the case that investing in our people was smart economic policy decision making, um, I went off on this journey to figure out what was I missing, what were we missing in the arsenal, um, and what were we missing about what was frankly causing the majority of white people to continue to throw a Republican party into power that served them up nothing but tax cuts for the wealthy, deregulation on corporate polluters and corporate abusers, and a gutting of all the things that we hold in common. And as it turns out, um, what is really the biggest impediment to our progress in society um, is this zero sum paradigm, this worldview of looking that is something that is really um, prevalent among white Americans, much less so among people of color. This idea that progress for people of color has to come at white people's expense. The idea that a dollar in my pocket means a dollar less in yours. And so what that does is that makes them very vulnerable to a zero sum scapegoating message that can get white folks to retreat from collective solutions if it looks like it's going to benefit the people that they think that they're in racial competition with. Now, in some ways, all of us have always known this, right? On a gut level, we have, you know, puzzled over why it is that, you know, what's the matter with Kansas, which didn't want to talk about race or, you know, all these other versions of the question of what on earth is going on. But what surprised me, Mo, that I really did not know was that back in the late 1950s and early 60s, two thirds, almost 70% of white Americans believed that the government ought to guarantee a job to anyone who wanted one and guarantee a minimum level of income in the country. White people, almost 70% of white people. And that to me, having you know worked as a policy advocate trying to get a $3 increase in the minimum wage for the, you know, and, and have it be opposed by the Republican Party and, and, and the plurality, if not in certain years, the majority of white people, it was just shocking to me to think, you know, that they could be so progressive. And then that was 56 and 60. And by 1964, the support went from almost 70% to 35%. So you have to ask, right, what happened? And that 35%, it stayed low ever since, right? Black people really supportive of the idea of a job guarantee and a minimum income guarantee throughout time. Um, so between 60 and 64, March on Washington in 1963, Kennedy going on a media blitz around um, civil rights. And then of course we know that Kennedy's successor, Linda Johnson, who signed the Civil Rights and Voting Rights Act would then become the last Democrat to win the majority of the white vote for president. And so if we, as people who have been trying to move the Democratic Party, not just into the left, but into the future and down to the grassroots into the multiracial base that is the future of this country and that is the beating heart of our value system in this country, don't understand the way that that zero sum racism has poisoned our political divide and made white the majority of white people vote for a party that is giving them cultural marketing and none of the economic goods that we all need, then I think we're missing it out. And so that was the big shocker to me was just how economically progressive and pro big government white people used to be before integration, before the civil rights movement, before all of the free stuff that government used to give was then begun to reach across the color line to people of color. Thank you. And that's really dramatic that just in a few years, it went from 
vast majorities to 35% of white folks shows you the power of uh, that messaging and how it's had a pretty dramatic impact of us being able to um, hold a multiracial national identity. So mm -hmm. now, and of course this, this book could not come at a more pivotal time, this conversation, right? You know, you're talking about the 50s and 60s, but you might as well be talking about right now, right? And we've talked a lot about how the decisions we make over the next few months will define our lives for the dec decades to come. In my, in my earlier sort of uh, uh, address, um, you know, we're talking about stuff that's live right now in Congress, but we think it's going to be uh, set the groundwork for 22, 24, maybe the next decade. Now we know that Democrats continue to kind of embrace the zero sum paradigm that you talk about. If they continue to push austerity measures while backing away from the solutions that actually meet the scale of people's needs, our communities will continue to experience unprecedented suffering. So I wanna hear your take on two things. What will it cost us if Congress goes too small on their plan mm -hmm. at this moment? And how will all of us, white, black, brown, native and newcomer, benefit from a bold jobs and care agenda that stack tackles economic inequality, public health, racism, the climate crisis, while creating millions of jobs in the process. He's singing my song. Um, so the parable at the heart of the Some of Us is the story of when towns across the country, not just in the South, had really well-funded, beautiful resort style public swimming pools. And when they were forced to integrate in the 50s and 60s, decided to drain them rather than integrate them. And the reason why the drained public pools at the heart of my book is that it helps to explain what has happened to the, the collective will to fund the public as the public has become more diverse. And so this is the test. Can we, in the throes of a pandemic that has changed every single aspect of how we live and work, that is tearing at the fabric of our society, can we finally refill the pool of public goods for everyone? recognizing that because of systemic racism, we're not all standing at the same depths. So no, it's not going to be exactly the same amount of aid or need for aid across all of our different communities, but we've all got to get our heads above water. So that's the question. And I do believe that it's very clear that the right wing is feeling empowered to, to vote against a pandemic relief bill that is more popular than anyone in Washington because they think they can land on that racial zero sum again. A Republican Congresswoman said, I'm not voting for this bill because Joe Biden's opening the border instead of opening our schools. How is that protecting our children, right? I mean, they're very clear about this, trying to tell white people, this is not for you, this is for these other people. Thankfully, white folks aren't buying it. Um, and that's really important because it's not there, I think that this moment in time, when we see cascading crises brought to us by drained pool politics from the pandemic itself, if we had a public health system in this country, if we had a functioning government, if we didn't have this reliance on the state's rights, you know, which is comes to us and remains with us because of racism and, and, and Jim Crow. Um, if we had a well-funded universal health care system in this country, we would not be the worst in the world pandemic response. And then, of course, drain pool politics like what has left you know, millions of people without in Texas. Um, there are so many examples of the drain pool politics delivering a cost of racism to everyone that I think that this moment is an historic moment for big, bold progress. So what does it look like to, for President Biden and Vice President Kamala Harris to deliver on the promises they made with the Build Back a Better agenda, which is not just the nearly $2 trillion COVID relief bill, but is a massive, massive program of investment in our future and in our people that puts care at the center. Um, that is, it's a game changing, it's a game changing proposition. And the question is, are the Democrats going to allow the filibuster and other arcane Senate rules to remain a block of progress? 
The Jim Crow era relic that is the filibuster is itself one of the many costs of racism to everyone. Now, I don't want to let Republicans off the hook here. I'm the first person to, to push Democrats, but let's be very clear. Republicans are by default making a 60 vote threshold for things that even the base of their party often supports now when it comes to so many elements of this pandemic relief bill. And so we've got to be very clear about who the true white supremacist party is and also put the wind in the sails for the Democrats to release the confines of the functioning of our government to do its job to help our people and not cave in to these arcane rules that were built up in order to preserve white supremacy, that were built up in order to stop a multiracial democracy from thriving. Oh, Mo's muted. Mo's muted, okay, <laughs> we're live. So thank you, I have one last question and we only have one minute, so you can answer this in however you can in that minute. My last question to you is as an author and policy expert, but also as a member of WFP's executive committee, how do we maximize our momentum over the recess and hold Congress mm -hmm. to using its pivotal moment that, that we're all in to realize a new vision for a future in which we fully embrace that life can be more than zero sum? That's exactly right. Okay, so first of all, um, you know, this is a time to show up and show out. This this big research, re recess is going to be a test for the Democrats of how much people are paying attention, how much it is an issue that is getting people out. The problem is, you know, the news media has moved on from the economic crisis, right? They continue to talk about COVID as, a, as an illness, um, and they continue to talk about the numbers because that's the way the media likes to report on things, but they've moved on from the economic crisis. So there can be a disconnect between a booming Washington DC and the rest of the country. And so if folks go home and see that this is a life or death issue and that people are really showing up in town halls, that they're demanding 15, that they're demanding to build back better that they're demanding the strongest possible pandemic relief bill and then some, then we will have a sense of, you know, backbone implanted in the Democrats who want to go home. And Republicans need to feel the heat as well. I know there are a lot of people who have read senators on this call, and it's extremely important that they, that they feel uncomfortable and, you know, try to avoid you on everywhere they see you, um, because this just cannot stand, this level of crisis and this level of need, um, while there are so much, so many people who are so comfortable that need to be afflicted right now. Thank you. And I, and I also just want to thank you in general for all of your work over the years. Uh, so, so grateful for you. Um, congratulations on the great success of your book. And we are forever grateful to have you on our team. And before we let you go, I want to strongly encourage anyone there's more than 500 of us right now. Uh, so anyone who has the means to take a moment right here and right now to get your own copy of Heather's book for a very limited time, you can get a copy of The Sum of Us when you make a donation of $25 or more to the WFP. So make sure to use the link we're dropping in the chat right now. We won't be able to send your copy unless you use this, ve this very link. So click on the link. There's, there's about 500 or more of us. Um, Click on the link. There's a reason why it's a New York Times bestseller. You want to understand this content. You want to share it with your friends and family. Um, and uh, you want to be able to use some of uh, the analysis that Heather spent years developing in order to engage in the local fights that we all have to engage in. And also this recess in order to engage with your member of Congress. So again, thank you so much, Heather. Oh, the book of them. Go to your town hall and just throw the book. Yeah, yeah. Also, the book is really weighty, so you could use it for <laughs> you know you can use it for all types of things. It's, it's a multi-purpose tool for our liberation. <laughs> Thank you, everyone. Thank you, WFP. Much love. Thank you. Right on. Okay, now it's my honor. By the way, if you got the book, just mention it in the chat. And if you're um if you're on social media, use hashtag WFP Assembly. If you heard anything and you want to share it with your social media uh, community on Twitter, on Facebook. So now I have the distinct honor to introduce our very special next guest, 
Congresswoman Cori Bush. Congresswoman Bush, welcome to the call. Uh, thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks for the invite. And Heather, that was amazing. <laughs> well, let's just get right thank into Thank you. It. And uh, so grateful to have you on the call and just to have you in the halls of Congress. Sis, I can't tell you how uh, proud and, and uh, how honored we are every time that you stand up um, as a black woman from St. Louis who were, was on the protest lines in, in Ferguson, able to speak truth to power every single day. So I just wanna uh, use this, this opportunity to, to just thank you for, for getting in the race, for winning and being a people's champion in Congress. Now, I wanna start our conversation by, by thanking you for holding the line on a $15 minimum wage. You are one of the leading voices in the fight for 15 right now. And a policy that the WFP has been organizing uh, for years now. And $15 is quite literally the difference between life and death for some working folks now more than ever. And, and, and would immediately lift one third of black workers out of poverty. And meanwhile, the same Democrats who we elected on a mandate of $15 are saying, there's nothing we could do, our hands are tied, but we know that's not true. So can you give us a picture of where we are in the fight for 15 and where we go and what we have to do in order to win this life-saving policy once and for all? Uh, sure, so like you said, it is a matter of life and death, you know, passing $15. And it's, you know, it should be more than $15. We really should be closer to $24 right now per hour. But this is at least the start. So to make it clear to everyone, none of us, at least the one, the people that I've been speaking to, we're not saying, yes, we're gonna get through, we're gonna work to get this $15 because that's what the people need. We're saying $15 is the floor. Like we've been, we've been begging for, we've been working for it. This has been going on for so many years that now we should be past that. But because we haven't gotten that yet and we're so close, like we're so close that we gotta at least get this done. So um, the house passed the, the minimum wage in our bill on Friday. So the house, we did our part. That passed on Friday in the wee hours. Um, we believe it can and should be in the Senate package. But, you know, as many of you have probably heard, the Senate parliamentarian said it can't be included in the Senate package because of procedural issues. For us, forget that. Right now, worrying about what the Senate Parliament, and no disrespect to the Senate parliamentarian, everybody has a job. This person did a lot of work to get where they are. I understand that. Thank you for what you've done and all your knowledge, but we're talking about life and death and for a person to make a decision that 27 million people should not have this increase, that 1 million people should not be pulled out of poverty for a person, a single person to make that decision. I say no. So that's why I've been fighting back and so many others have. It's time to at least get this get this you know for our community and then as soon as we get this then we need to push forward and continue to work for the rest and you know um just so people are clear too president biden and vice president harris can refute the senate parliamentarians advice to strike down the 15 dollars an hour minimum wage provision from the american rescue plan people have to know that there is clear a clear historical precedent about it so we're looking to them to stand with us as well Thank you. And we couldn't agree with you more. We're, we're in that fight. And we want to make it known that um, although the parliamentarian has made the, their, their ruling, that the president and the vice president have the power, right? There's more that can be done. Now, the fight for 15 is, of course, all part of a broader fight, the, the fight to build a post-COVID America where Black folks can finally breathe and where we can all finally breathe as working people of every race. And so I wanna bring tonight's conversation into focus a bit by grounding the fights ahead of us as part of the centuries long movement for black liberation. Early on in this call, I, I talked a bit about why the next phase of this fight is critical specifically for black folks. And I know this is an analysis we both share, working people and especially black people 
can't wait any longer for the jobs and care we need to recover from this crisis. So Congresswoman Bush, can you tell us how you're using the power of your office to pursue an agenda to, to get one step closer to black liberation and share why you believe the fight for recovery recess is critical to building a nation where black folks can thrive. So it starts with centering our struggles and our issues. And uh, one thing that uh, people have said about me, why do you like go through things? You know, you should understand how to go around things because you'll get there quicker. Well, I've been through and in the middle of our struggles, I've been unhoused. I've been, you know, I've been unhoused living out of a car with my children. I've, I've been hungry. I've been low wage. I've been uninsured. You know, I've been through so many things. I've had COVID-19 and was under, was uninsured. And, you know, now I have two hospital stays worth of bills stacking, stacked up. You know, I know what it's like. I've lost loved ones and very, very close people to gun violence. I know um, a lot of our issues. Um, and so, so being inside right now, going through this, being a part of the Democratic Party, going through politics, um, I'm able to take our issues, the issues that I know of, the issues that my friends have dealt with and, and, and our networks have dealt with, the people closest to us. That's the other thing. Bring the people that's closest to you. Bring the people from your milieu. Bring them in. And so that's what this is about. That's that liberation, because I'm speaking from a place of experience experiences up a place of lived experience and though I'm so I'm able to pinpoint that thing a little differently and that's where our liberation is going to come from when we can speak to that thing boldly and plainly but speak on it also in a place of power and so I can't get to the place of power and then I want to water down my message or I want to back up or watch make sure I'm not hurting this person's feeling make sure that I can still come to this party make sure I'm still invited to this bump that you don't have to invite me to a dang thing I don't care about that give my people what they need and so I, I so you know it, true liberation it requires bold voices bold policies and so we we will talk about decarceration we'll talk about defunding the police i don't care if you don't like it or not because when st louis is number one for police killings year after year year after year when we are still number one even after all 400 days of protests from michael brown and other protests and we're still number one so yes, I'm going to say defund the police and put that money into education and, and so many other things. When we, we have to end the racial wage gap. If we don't end the racial wage gap, then we will continue to struggle. And so how do we close the racial wage gap? I need to talk about that plainly. I need to talk about the fact that as a black woman, I went to school the same way my counter, my white male counterparts did. And I got the job the same way my white male counterparts did, or it might've been a little more difficult, but I got that job. So why is it that I make 61 to 63 cent on the dollar and they get the whole thing? Am I working 60, a 61 percent, a 61 cent effort? You know, like what's, did, did I leave after 61% of the day? You know, I'm trying to understand what the deal is. And so we have to speak about those things plainly. We have to talk about how women carry the most um, student debt in the country and out of all the groups though, black women carry the most. So when we get 61 cent on every dollar that we earn and we carry the most debt uh, student debt and we carry it the longest so how so we have to talk about those things very boldly we have to talk about environmental justice we have to talk we can't we cannot leave out our environment and think that we're going to have progress our environment deals with black maternal mortality and black infant mortality it it deals with that it deals with our children and asthma, with the asthma rates in the black community, black and brown communities. It deals with, um, you know, uh, living in a lethal environment with gun violence or with um, with police violence. It not, it deals with what fossil fuel companies are doing to our communities and all of that. It deals with lead and asbestos and clean water and clean air or dirty water and 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 you know all of that. So we bring that directly to the house floor. We bring that directly to legislation and. We not only bring it, but we fight for it and we make sure that those people who believe that we are talking too much or that we are a little too radical, a little too far to the left, 
We make sure that they understand we're talking about saving lives while you're worried about labels and slogans and you're worried about, you know, timing and we got to do things in a, you know, we got to, it's got to be, you know, incremental. And while you're trying to be incremental, my folks are dying. So I can't hear you anymore. And that's how we have to, we have to deal with this. Amen. And uh, while you were talking, it just gave me goosebumps. And I, I think I speak for everybody on the call when I say, it's a new day when somebody like Corey Bush is representing all of us in the halls of Congress. Mm -hmm. um, so my final question, and we just have one minute. Sure. Last question is about strategy. How can the WFP work alongside you and other progressive members of Congress to win the boldest rescue package possible while paving the way for a jobs and care agenda that tackles economic inequality, public health, racism, and climate change? How do we get that done in one minute? Yes, I love this question. So first of all, be you and bring that to the table. I'm a politivist. I brought my activism and I added added it to the politics. And now, you know, this is who I am. So be that authentic you and figure out what that is that you can bring. Everybody on this call has something. So do that. Um, because we're facing so many crises, there are part, there are different things that you can do. If you, if your thing, because we don't have a lot of time, if your thing is the medical field, then we need you to step up and is there a task force? Is there something that can be built? Right, right within Working Families Party. If you are uh, someone that deals in construction, what is it that you can act like everything everything everybody has a piece if you can inform us so all of us members of Congress right now. I don't have a I don't know a thing about construction. I don't know a thing about like so, so many things I don't know about I'm a nurse help me. So put your thing deal with whatever it is that you have pull that thing out and deliver to us. The, the, the intricacies of what that thing is that we're missing. Fill in all the holes for us because legislation happens up here. We miss the people here. So do that for us and bring that to us and let's work together to make this change. Amen. Thank you so much. I couldn't agree with you more. We all need to come together to make that change. And on that note, um, again, thank you, Congresswoman Bush. And before you go, I wanna lift up your leadership in this moment and make an ask from everyone on this call. So. Congresswoman Bush and other WFP leaders are holding the line on a $15 minimum wage, but it is going to take all of us to light a fire under the senators threatening to block this life-saving raise. So I'm calling on every single person. Now there's more than 500 people on this line. So I'm calling on every single one of you right now uh, to join the WFP this Tuesday for a massive text campaign where we'll be contacting the constituents of these senators and organizing them to hold their lawmakers accountable to pass a $15 minimum wage. So take out your phones right now. And once you do this, mention it in the chat. So take out your phone and text the number 15 to 30403. So I got my phone out, go in the, in the little text box, don't wait, do it right now, and text 15 to 30403 to join us on Tuesday, or there's a link in the chat, just click the link. And once you've clicked the link, or if you've text 15, put in the chat done, so we know that you've done it. Now there's more than 500 of us, so if I don't see a bunch of duns, if I don't see you light up that chat, I don't know you've done it. Let us know that you've done it. It's easy just to text or click that link. Now this is not just a, a time for us as WFP to pontificate, and to come together and make ourselves feel good about our issues and how righteous we are. This is a time for action. This is an organizing call. This is a time to organize. I expect as many of you to join us Tuesday so we could get busy in order to move that needle. So once again, thank you again for your leadership on this issue and so many others, Congresswoman Bush, and thank you for taking the time to join us tonight. I, I would bet many of the folks on this call will be throwing down with you over the next few weeks and we're sure to see you very, very soon. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye. So we've just been talking a lot about why it's critical we level up our organizing. I see, I see some more duns in there. While you say done, uh, let's, let's give Congresswoman uh, Bush her flowers and tell her thank you. But keep up. I need to see more duns. I'm looking for 500. I'm counting all of them. So we've been talking a lot about why it's critical we level up our organizing over the next few weeks with a plan to win a bold jobs and care agenda that we deliver real relief and recovery to working people. Now, while creating millions of jobs and investing in black and brown communities all at the same time, right? So 
Our next guest is here to talk about how we do just that, repping the WFP in West Virginia. I'm so excited to welcome activist and WFP leader, Danielle Walker, who is a leader in the West Virginia House of Delegates. Danielle. Good evening. Thank you, Maurice, for having me. And I must say, once again, I am starstruck as I was on November 3rd when you called me in the middle of Giant Eagle while I was shopping for seniors to tell me, I know you will do well tonight and you will be a voice of the people in the House of Delegates. So thank you. I am humbly honored. Let's go. We are fired up and we are fed up and I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go too. And thank you for not making a liar out of me. It's so good to see you. You are that that fighter for the people. So Danielle, I know we don't have a lot of time tonight and I wish we had more. So I, I just have one, 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 one question for you, right? Yes. How yes. do you and the West Virginia WP plan to build the grassroots power it takes to win jobs and care for the people of West Virginia? So look, we're gonna do online and in-person rallies and town halls at both of the senator's offices. So that is Senator Manchin and Senator Capito because this is DEI, this is diversity, inclusion, and equity, and no one will be excluded in this. We're gonna educate West Virginians on what the Thrive Program is gonna do. It's gonna bring over 50,000 jobs to our people, in our homes, in our mountains. It's gonna build us up like we haven't been built before. You can't break us because you didn't make us. And it's time that we rise and we use our voices, West Virginia. We're gonna stay connected and we're gonna also bring some concerts of West Virginia artists and others. We're tired of being last and we say no more. West Virginians are resilient, we are strong and we are free. And we will continue to use our voices in unity and solidarity. That is so exciting. It's so great to know that there's a grassroots movement of West Virginians doing that work and making sure they all get the smoke. Republicans, Democrats, both senators, everyone could get the smoke. Everyone could be held accountable uh, to these very, very popular issues. And you know, I think it's wonderful that you have a local perspective so folks understand that this is 50,000 local jobs in West Virginia. That's right. Billion okay. of dollars of new jobs coming to us. So that's what we have to understand, the new. You are part of this. West Virginia, a place to live, work, and raise a family. How about West Virginia, a place where you can stay, rebuild, and succeed? Absolutely. That's what we need. Well, let's get it done. Now, thank you so much, Danielle. Um, I wish we had more time. We'll get you oh, on some you. other time uh, to report back on that amazing organizing work. Um, now, everything we've heard tonight underlies one key point. If we're going to realize the vision of the People's Charter, we need to be ready to throw everything we have at holding Joe Biden and the Democrats in Congress accountable to win the world we deserve. Everyone on this call has a role to play in this fight. I know that we're all here for the same reason, to come together across race and place and build real political power for our communities, to organize um, uh, our political leaders to pass a big enough relief package and keep white nationalists out of power, to recover to heal and build a brighter future together. So friends, this is the point of the call where I'm going to ask each and every one of you to throw your hat in the ring. Winning this fight will require all of us to show up and to have concrete ways for each and every one of you to plug in. Now, right now, we're mobilizing our members, members of our partner organizations and working people across the country to show up in big numbers at virtual town hall events and direct actions all over the country. We're harnessing the political power of our allies in office and the movement power we built in the streets. And together we will win, but we need you to throw down with us. So I'm talking about, if you're listening to me, that you is you, right? There's no other, it's you. And tonight I'm going to ask you to do two things. This is an organizing call. If you're on this call and, and you're wondering why it's so interactive and why we're making so many asks, this is what an organizing call looks like. It's interactive. We're putting our, our, our time, our money where our mouth is. So first, we want you to plug into and even to help organize direct actions in your state. To do that, we're asking you to text. So get, we're gonna get your phone out again. Text the word recess 
to 30403. Now I'm gonna wait. I'm not asking you to think about it. I'm asking you to do it right now. Take your phone out right now, go into the text part of uh, the text acts and text the word recess to 30403. Texting this number will get you immediate updates on upcoming events and actions, and you can expect some key updates in the next few days. When you've done texting, type text in the chat box. And I need, you, I need you to blow it up. There's hundreds of us right now. I see a few folks who said done, thank you, but that's just, I, I think I might've just seen 10. We need to see everybody on this call. If you believe in freedom, if you want a $15 minimum wage, if you wanna make sure that those 50,000 jobs make it to the people in West Virginia and the millions of jobs make it to the people all across the country, text recess now to 30403. Second, we're asking folks to send a message to Joe Biden and his administration, demanding he adopt the Thrive Agenda into his recovery plan. Our partners at the Green New Deal Network built a tool that makes sending that letter just a one-click job. Just click on this link that's in the chat right now, and you could send a letter to Joe Biden right now demanding that the Thrive Agenda enters that recovery package. And we need everybody on here. If you hear me, make sure that you text recess to 30403 and click on that link and let us know that you're done. This is a, this is a collective accountability exercise. That's why when we're done, we click done and we write done in the chat, right? So that we stand up and we show that we're doing the work that we claim we believe in, right? And when you do that work and you stand up, you give others permission to also do the work. Let's keep it going. Now, thank you to everyone for signing up. If you're joining the Recovery Recess team tonight and taking action with us, again, let us know. Let us know that you join. And as we enter this fight together, it's critical we share our stories with one another. So next, we're going to take a few minutes to hear from Tamar Jacobson, a teacher and a member of the Wisconsin Working Families Party, who has been organizing her community to realize the vision of the People's Charter. Tamar, I'm honored the WFP is your political home. Can you share a little bit about yourself and what inspires you to organize your community and communities across Wisconsin to build the future we deserve? Oh yeah. Um, thank you, Maurice. I am honored and stoked to be here as a proud volunteer with the Wisconsin Working Families Party. Um, we've been engaging voters and progressive supporters across the state, predominantly uh, through texting, a little plug there for the texting. Um, with resources from the volunteer crew and candidates committed to building at the grassroots level, guided by the People's Charter. Um, my inspiration comes from home and work. I grew up with an immigrant parent who was passionate about social justice, but had a fear-based vigilance from the government he fled from to stay under the radar, so to speak, which kept us on the quieter side of activism. My passion is also driven by my main gig, as you mentioned, for three decades and counting, working in special education. However, this has typically been within disingenuous, racist institutions that we all know cater to entitled white families, old school Eurocentric thinking, rather than turning anti-racist abolitionist talk into real action. The students I've been and families I've been working with are ready they have been ready to flourish and prosper. The urgency to smash the school to prison pipeline is never been stronger, no more waiting, no more bullshit. I'm so proud um, that Wisconsin and Working Families Party has become my political home um, for myself and all these families that I work with and all the people I connect with through texting to find our voices and uplift intentions to actions with an invitation to participate and go big with flames. Thank you, Tamar. Everybody, let's, get, let's lift up Tamar and the work that she's doing. It's really our volunteer energy, the work that our volunteers and members and activists, the work that they do every single day, that is the lifeblood blood of the party. We salute you. I appreciate the work that you're doing to build a Wisconsin that works for the many. And I need to say one thing to everybody on the call tonight, how we build and maintain that political home, our political home uh, together is, is through something that I think is critical to any grassroots political movement. Everything you've heard tonight from all of our guests should make clear the moral mandate that all of us have to ensure a nation that is just and kind, that allows all of us to thrive, no matter where we're from, what we believe, 
what we might look like, who we might love, or how much money our families might have. Now, I said earlier tonight that the election uh, was a mile marker, not a finish line. I said that we all need to stay in the fight. We need to stand together and support one another. Well, tonight, let's stake our claim in that vision. Let's stake our claim in all the organizing we have to do, the tremendous work to fight for 15, to fight for the Thrive Agenda. And let's do that by becoming a member of WFP. Some of us are already members. Some of us on are not. At the WFP, a member is anyone who shares the values of our party and engages in the fight by making a commitment of $10 a month or more. I'm currently a member at $40. Uh, that makes sense for me and my budget. Um, a few weeks ago, I spent $40 on takeout. So the way that I think about it is if I could spend $40 on takeout, I could absolutely make an investment every month in my liberation through a $40 donation of the Working Families Party. So tonight we invite you to be a co-owner of the party by becoming a member. We are a party owned by working people, not billionaires. I invite you to become a member today uh, and start at $10 or more to build the party of our dreams. If you're inspired and ready, come on in, the water's fine. Now you could text member at 30403 right now, or you could click on the link. If you're already a member, you could decide right now to bump up. If you're a member at $10, you could bump up to 12 or 15. If you're on the fence, get off the fence, get in the fight. We are a people power movement. The only way that we could create spaces like this, the only way we have the tools for to be able to text um, folks all across the country, the only way we're able to flank Congress people like Congresswoman Cori Bush is through the grassroots donations of our members, as well as the volunteer efforts of our members. So we invite all of you to become a member right now. At the WP, we depend on each other. We depend on your smarts, your creativity, your testimony, your passion, your treasure, all of that. So tonight, I'm going to ask you to join as an official WP member. And once you've done so, let us know in the chat. If you're already a proud member, say you're a member. If you bumped up, say you bumped up. If you're becoming a member for the first time, let us know in the chat. I'll just wait one more moment. There's somebody in right now who's kind of on the fence. I, I, I could feel you're on the fence. The water's fine as a member. It's time to get off of fence sitting. 2021 is not a time for fence sitting. 2021 is a time for action. Let's put our money, our time, and our passion where our mouth is. Now, okay, let's shift some gears and thank you again. Thank you for your membership. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, John. Thank you, Idris. Thank you, Jackie. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Sora. Thank you so much. Thank you, Iman. Thank you. Thank you so much, Bella. Danita, everything matters. All of your membership uh, dues go to building this community. Now I'm gonna shift gears. We're going to use an interactive platform to connect with all of you joining by phone and by video. I'm going to ask Raven, a digital organizer managing uh, the work that we do in uh, California, the California Working Families Party, to lead us through it. Raven, are you there? Yes, hello, hello. Um... Wow, okay, well, thank you, Maurice. Um, my name's Raven. I'm gonna lead us through Menti. And I just wanna say that I am feeling hyped and energized and just so excited to be part of this community full of powerful people and to call this my political home. And actually part of building this community is to listen to everyone, to build trust across differences. And it's really the only way that we are going to be strong enough to defeat the people who are in the way of our liberation, white nationalists, warmongers, and billionaires. And that's why we always, always make time for one of my favorite parts of these calls, and that is connecting with each other as part of this community. So uh, in just a moment, we're actually going to ask for all of you to share your thoughts through a website called Menti. If you are joining by video, you'll be able to see responses as they are shared from everyone on this call. And I will be reading them out loud, I promise, to make sure that folks joining us by phone can listen and kind of participate as well. But uh, the assembly is a space where we can really build this community. And the best way to do it is together to be 
in conversation and to not leave this space without hearing about what everyone thought, you know, like, did we, we loved Corey's speech. I know that, right? And Heather and just everyone who spoke, there was so much power here and we want to hear those ideas. So um, if that's something that you're interested in, we'd love to hear from you. And I'm gonna outline some of those steps now. So to get set up first, you're gonna go to www.menti.com on your cell phone or on your computer. Again, you're going to menti.com on your cell or your computer. Then, and hopefully this is getting dropped in the chat to, to help y'all along. But second, you're going to input the code 5098042, and then you press submit. Again, the code is 5098042, and then you click submit. And again, this is from menti.com. Next, you should see an image of our wonderful speakers tonight. I'm still fangirling over here from them, but I'm gonna be asking you questions for you to answer from this website. So you should see them on your phone or your screen, whatever you're looking at. We'll also be sharing them here. So if you choose not to you know, look it up, you can still absolutely see what everyone else is inputting. So the responses are completely anonymous and they will show up on our screen again. And then I will read them out loud for folks who are just um, listening. So we're gonna go through a couple of questions, not too long. I know we're still, we're a little over time right now. So we don't wanna take up too much of your time but we do want your feedback. And then I'll turn it over to Maurice to close us out. So if you haven't already, again, menti.com, the code is 5098042. Are we ready? I'm ready, I'm excited. So let's get into it. Okay, so our first question is, what did you hear tonight that inspires you? What would you like to uplift? And I'm gonna be reading through the comments. I'm gonna read as they pop up on the screen. We're excited, what inspired you? I know there was a lot. Our chat was on fire today, all of it. Okay, well, I love that. Passion, yes, off of the fence. I remember Maurice, you said 2021 is not the time to be on the fence. Just Cori Bush, period, absolutely. Power, yes. I'm, I'm still thinking about that pool analogy, right? I think there's just so much that came from this. Commitment, yes, investing in your liberation. A lot of good, really powerful answers here. Oh, it's getting smaller, I'm trying to read it now. I think that's such a big one. I'm trying to pull something specific. Um, just to let you all know, as words get bigger, it means more and more people have kind of consolidated around that answer. Change, I'm seeing in the chat. Um, truth, positive attitudes, that's wonderful. I'm really kind of leaning towards liberation. That's a big one, it's just staying large on the screen. And I think that means so much. It really ties together the narrative here that we are working towards our liberation, that, you know, Corey being on the front lines, Congresswoman, you know, it's just, it's so, so helpful to us. And Heather, everything that you, just the truth that you were preaching, I think that we have just amazing voices and y'all are, ooh, action as well here. Yes, action, 2021 is about action, investing, becoming part of the party. So many good answers. I'm gonna pause here so we can move to our next question. We wanna hear from you. Waiting for our slide. Yes, what does jobs and care mean to you and your community? Ooh, dignity, already a big, a big answer here for all. I'm waiting a sec. Dignity is staying very large. I think that's so, mm, like I, I can't even really put it into words, but dignity is just getting paid the wages you deserve and not having pollution infesting your community, having access to care and to time off and to just, again, everything that we would want for our family, for every family. I'm like choking up. I love this. Stability equality. These are words that are foundational to what we deserve and to what everyone, including working class people, people of color, deserve. Equality, I'm seeing. Yes, freedom, a freedom agenda. 
possibility, respect. I think all of these are really reflective of what we talked about on today's call. It's so good that we're on the same page. Um, how about we move to our last question here? Yes, we all have a role to play in the fight to hold our Congress accountable to passing the jobs and care agenda we need to thrive. What's yours? What do you see as your role? Now, who we got a lot of good advice about this today. Um, Corey, I believe she said, bring you, bring you. What does it mean to bring you? Contact lawmakers, texting on Tuesday, data analysis, persisting. Okay, we're talking to people, we're organizing, we're contacting our reps. A lot of good stuff. I see very similar answers here too. It sounds like we're texting. We are texting, y'all. Okay, we're lifting all voices. We're educating. I'm very interested in that, educating. Hopefully, yeah, we're, we're showing up to these town halls. I would, I would love that, just to show up and show out. We have to be present. We're organizing in West Virginia. Yes, we are. And we're running for office, forcing people to have conversations that are necessary. Yes, I'm looking through the chat as well for people who are commenting over here. Yes, care should never be a one-way street. We should care about everyone, absolutely. Yes, I mean, we've got some great answers. It sounds like we are calling our Congress people. We are texting them. We are letting them know that we are unhappy, that we demand, do we, we demand a Thrive agenda, right? So a lot of really great content. We are on the same page. We are. We're part of a party that believes that we, oh man, we believe in I'm like getting choked up. I'm just, I'm so happy to be part of this community where these are things that we just all believe in together. So thank you. Yes, we are helping people to access the bare minimum of what they deserve, right? We are fighting for it. So thank you. Thank you to all of these answers. We have one more part here. And it's really just a question. Where are we today? Are we proud WFP members? Did you join today? A lot of us, so many of us joined the party today. And if you're thinking about it, we get that too. 2021 is not the year, as we've said, to be on the fence. But we want you to feel comfortable in this community. And sometimes you got to earn that. So we want to talk to you. We want to hear from you. Hopefully this end segment made you a little bit more comfortable, right? But we're so excited. Thank you to everyone who joined tonight. Thank you to everyone who has been a proud WFP member. We're so grateful to have you as part of this movement in this space, this community. And I am so inspired to co-create our political home together and really want to uplift our supporters. And if you haven't already, you can text member to 3040 free to join this community and to invest again in your political freedom. But yes, okay, so thank you all so much for participating, for sharing your feedback, for being vulnerable with us. I know it can sometimes be difficult to have these conversations in the open, but we want to make these spaces where you, you can feel comfortable doing that. So thank you. I hope that hearing not just from WFP electeds and staff, but supporters helps to bring you some sense of the community that we want to build together. We want this to be your political home and we want your feedback too. So thank you again. Feel free to share in the chat, but Maurice, turning it back to you. All right, thank you, Raven. Everybody give it up to Raven. Uh, Raven's doing wonderful work in the state of California, uh, building a base of WFP activists, uh, candidates and others who are fighting for a world and a country and a government that fights for the many, not the few. Now, um, I wanna lift up one thing that I heard. Uh, I heard and I saw the word dignity. And when we come together, and the reason why I'm an organizer, the reason why organizing is my religion, when we come together as working people, as poor, poor folks, as everyday people, as people who have been on the margins of power, and we're able to do this work together, we are reaffirming our humanity. We're seeing ourselves over again through the work that we do with others. We, I see my reflection through my, my brothers, my sisters, my siblings in the struggle with me. And so that dignity really comes from the organizing. You can't deny our power as working people. You can't tell us 
that our work is not essential. You can't tell us that the work that we do to build this country, the labor that was stolen for hundreds of years, that, that many of us who came here as enslaved Africans uh, uh, put in to build this country, that working people today, the labor that is taken from us, isn't the backbone of this country and the society. So that dignity roots our struggle. And that word dignity is something that I think is, is a powerful uh, sort of uh, a piece of the puzzle that builds a people's movement. Now, what we're going to do, um, we're gonna continue to build that dignity and, and continue to build that community together. And I'm so grateful that you're choosing to be a part of it by being on this line. Some of you became members, some of you are still on the fence, all of you are part of our community. Now, we close every month with something I'm borrowing from my siblings in the movement for Black Lives. In just a moment, I'm going to ask you, not right now, just wait, I'm going to ask you to unmute your, your, yourself, not right now, uh, because I want everybody to say goodnight together. When we do this, it, it's like a beautiful sort of symphony, a, con, a, a con, cacophony of, of, of sounds. Now, for some of us, we might wanna use words, others might wanna sing, others might wanna beat it out, whatever you wanna do to express this solidarity, this cross movement, this cross gender, cross race, cross region solidarity, where all of us see each other's liberation in one another. So, so just think about, meditate on that sound, on that message, on that note, uh, on, that, on, that, on that passage that you wanna share. Now, for those of you that are joining by video, look at the mic icon on the bottom left-hand side. When you click that icon, don't do it now, it'll unmute your, your, yourself. If you're dialed in by phone um, and, and you're not using the Zoom app, you could unmute by, by, by clicking on star six. Don't do it, I'll tell you when to do it. So, so just get ready to say goodnight together and unmute and I'll tell you when. So we're gonna do it in three, two, one, unmute. Good night. 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 Good